Hi, my name is Jim Freeman. I'm a civil rights lawyer and I direct an organization called the Social Movement Support Lab. What I do and really what I've done for almost 20 years now is work with the black and brown communities across the U.S. that are most directly impacted by systemic racism. So I've worked in Mississippi, Philadelphia, Oakland, Chicago, Los Angeles, Denver, and lots of other places to assist those communities in addressing the policies and systems that produce and perpetuate racial inequities. I also recently published a book called Rich Thanks to Racism, How the Ultra Wealthy Profit from Racial Injustice, to share some lessons learned from fighting systemic racism. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The first thing I'll say about the book is that my hope is that those who read it aren't as resistant to the conclusions reached in it as I would have been if I'd read them, let's say, 10 years ago. Back then, I wouldn't have wanted to believe them. Quite frankly, the implications would have been too much for me to handle. While I'd certainly like to say that I've always had a clear understanding of the causes of racial inequality, that isn't really true. I now know that for much of my career, I didn't fully appreciate what people of color were up against. Back then, I thought that the biggest obstacle to justice was ignorance. That's what I believed to be our greatest enemy. I thought that our lingering racial inequities could all be traced back to the most unenlightened aspects and individuals of my parents' and grandparents' generations. In other words, I thought our opponents were the same as they'd been in the 1960s U.S. Civil Rights Movement. That what we were facing was just the toxic residue of Bull Connor turning his fire hoses and attack dogs against children in Birmingham, or of state troopers and civilians brutally beating marchers on Bloody Sunday in Selma, or of George Wallace proudly proclaiming his support for segregation. And so in my mind, all that we had to do was point out the lingering injustice in our society, and surely the American public and policymakers would spring into action to achieve true racial equality. Surely the moral arc of the universe would, as Dr. King said, bend towards justice. It was only much later in my career that I realized that what we were fighting against wasn't ignorance. What we were really up against was much, much worse than that. What we were really up against was this. So let me explain why the racial justice we've been fighting for hasn't been nearly as forthcoming as I had expected, and why the moral arc of the universe isn't bending in the ways I anticipated. Because this realization didn't come from losing the struggle for equality. It came from winning, or at least from what we typically think of as winning. Over the years, the communities I work with have led many campaigns to advance their most critical priorities, such as achieving education equity, ending mass incarceration, protecting immigrants' rights, and dismantling the school-to-prison pipeline. And they've won many, many significant and even groundbreaking victories. They've not so many wins that one would naturally assume that the racial inequities they face would have substantially diminished or even disappeared by now. However, even after all of these years and really staggering sacrifices by the individuals who led those efforts, it's difficult to make the case that those communities are better off than when we started. Now, that's not to say that those victories didn't represent significant steps forward or that they haven't produced many undeniably positive effects. They did and they have. It's just that for every two steps forward these communities have been able to make, there are other forces at work that are quick to push them two steps back, if not more. And at first you don't see it. All your attention is focused on winning the campaign in front of you. And initially you also think that, that doing so should be quite straightforward, as these efforts were all intended to address what should have been really clear-cut, no-brainer issues. All we were doing was pointing out obvious injustices that were deeply harmful to large segments of the population, such as the rampant overuse of out-of-school suspensions and expulsions in schools, or far too many people being pushed into the criminal justice system, or the inhumane treatment of immigrants, or the decimation of the public school system, and so on. In every instance, there were easy, vastly superior alternat alternatives available to the government agency that was responsible for the injustice. Yet every fight was a slog. We met extreme resistance at every turn. And even when we won, the opposition never stopped fighting against racial equality. So we would strike down a discriminatory policy, but then another one that may have looked a little different but had the exact same effects would soon follow. Or we would successfully pass our own policy that we'd written ourselves, one that was designed to address an obvious injustice and institute a superior and more equitable set of practices but it would never be fully implemented. Plus, while we were fighting on one set of issues, several 
uh, several other horrific policies would be passed around other sets of issues. So it was really like we were in a big game of racism whack-a-mole. For every injustice we thought we were solving, an equally nasty one would pop up to replace it. So no matter how hard we fought and how many victories we accumulated, we rarely felt like we were really moving the needle. And it was then that I began to, to detect some patterns to what I was seeing. So I started to notice that the opposition we faced in each site was rather consistent. So regardless of which state or region of the country I was working in, the bad policies we were up against were usually being supported by the same set of advocacy organizations, think tanks, and media outlets. And all across the country, when communities of color would attempt to address the most significant barriers they faced in their day-to-day -day lives, they would often run squarely into the same people from the same organizations pushing the same set of policy ideas. Thus, over and over, I would encounter policymakers in various states who would all seem to have the exact same ideas for new policy initiatives at almost the exact same time. It was really quite eerie. You know, legislators in Tallahassee, Florida would suddenly come up with the same quote unquote innovative reform proposal as the legislators in Denver, Colorado or Springfield, Illinois. And local school districts and police departments in Maryland and Arizona and Mississippi, California, and New York would somehow all implement virtually identical policies at the same time. And while these policy initiatives cut across a variety of issue areas, they would all have one thing in common, which is that they would all have a crushing effect on communities of color. And so I got curious. I started to research these policies and where they came from. I looked more deeply into the organizations that were supporting them. And then I began to research who was providing the funding for this network of organizations. And I was shocked to discover that my research kept leading to the same small group of names. Most of the policies that were causing massive human suffering on a daily basis could all be traced back to a relatively small group of billionaires and multimillionaires. In other words, every day the communities I was working with were fighting back against racial inequities. In many cases, they were fighting for their very lives. And at the same time, a group of ultra wealthy corporate America and Wall Street executives was investing in organizations that were actively opposing those communities' efforts. They were, in effect, promoting the perpetuation of racial injustice. Now, to be clear, these weren't rich people donating their version of spare change into organizations they found appealing for one reason or another so that they could get a tax deduction. This was billions of dollars being pooled together and invested strategically around a particular agenda that was ravaging low-income communities of color. This was a massive investment that was propping up an entire industry of organizations peddling racial inequality at the national and even international levels. Yet because of how effectively these efforts had been hidden, or at least disguised, virtually no one seemed to know what they were up to. So this was a real game changer for me to realize that there were actual people who were the driving force behind systemic racism and who had used their wealth to essentially deputize so many others in advancing the policies that I had seen cause enormous suffering. But this realization also forced me to acknowledge that my initial strategy of attacking individual ignorance by itself was doomed to fail. Merely raising awareness of inequities would never be enough to dismantle the racism that was being defended so vigorously by these ultra wealthy opponents of racial justice. These weren't people who were simply unaware of the devastating harm being caused by systemic racism or who had a different viewpoint about how to address equity concerns. For them, the harm being caused by systemic racism wasn't a bug. It was a feature. Thus, I began to learn how powerful a tool racial injustice has been for the ultra wealthy in advancing their economic and political interests. Indeed, for anyone who has ever wondered why deep racial inequities persist more than 50 years after the civil rights movement, the biggest reason is as simple as it is disturbing. Systemic racism is, for a small number of corporate and Wall Street executives, enormously profitable. In other words, we have racism profiteers in this country ultra wealthy people who put their resources to work in defending or expanding racial inequities in ways that result in greater economic or political power for themselves. People who profit from real harm that they cause in black and brown communities. I've seen up close what this looks like and it's truly devastating for millions of families. I also realized that this horrific form of modern day racism wasn't adequately captured by the term systemic racism.
The problem is that it's a somewhat abstract and impersonal term. It makes it seem like these are natural or inevitable occurrences, like no one is responsible. In reality, behind all the billions of dollars in investments the ultra wealthy were making in opposition to communities of color, there was intentionality. There was strategy. In other words, my eyes were open to the fact that many of the policies that plague communities of color aren't doing so incidentally. They're doing so purposefully. And the devastation I was witnessing being caused to families across the country wasn't the side effect or unintended consequence of some well-meaning set of policies. It was the direct result of their communities being sabotaged. Once I recognized that, it became clear that this particular brand of injustice, what the ultra wealthy had been doing for decades and were still doing today, went far beyond what I had understood to be systemic racism. This was different. This was what I now call strategic racism. Thus, I finally realized the truth, that the moral arc of our universe wouldn't naturally be bending toward anything resembling justice. On the contrary, it was being forcibly bent toward injustice and would continue to be unless the rest of us came together to stop it. The reason why this is so important is because most people, including me for a long time, misdiagnose the problem and thus we tend to misidentify potential solutions and we don't ultimately change anything. For many of us, when it comes to addressing systemic racism, we often act like there's nobody on the other side of the fight. Or we think that the opposition is what's often called the alt-right or it's folks like the QAnon shaman or the Charlottesville white supremacists with tiki torches or the folks terrorizing school boards over critical race theory. But that's not who create all the laws and policies that are responsible for systemic racism. They're not the ones doing the heavy lifting and defending or even expanding these policies. What people need to understand is that those folks are just foot soldiers in the strategic racism machine. To really understand how systemic racism is perpetuated year after year, generation after generation, you have to understand how the rest of the machine operates and who it benefits. So let's start at the top, the executive level, as I call it. This is where we find the billionaire class, particularly corporate America and Wall Street executives. Some of these folks are pretty well known for their political activity, such as the Koch family, most notably Charles Koch, the chairman and CEO of Koch Industries and one of the richest men in the world who's organized a network of dark money donors from the ultra wealthy class to support his agenda. Others have received less public scrutiny, such as the hundreds of corporate members of ALEC. For those who aren't familiar with ALEC, that stands for the American Legislative Exchange Council, which represents hundreds of the largest corporations in the US. ALEC is the primary vehicle through which the ultra wealthy have organized themselves politically. It has a reported 300 plus corporate members and 2000 legislative members who work together, usually secretively, on legislation that advances those corporations' common agenda. ALEC is incredibly prolific. Over 1000 of its model bills are introduced every year in state legislatures across the country, with one in five of them being passed into law. While that legislation covers a broad range of issues, a large percentage of it has been directed at protecting, expanding, and benefiting from systemic racism. In other words, perhaps the most powerful force advancing systemic racism in the US is an organization whose current and recent members include many of the largest and most well-known corporations in the US. I'm talking about Walmart, Google, Home Depot, General Electric, Coca-Cola, and hundreds of others. So the way this machine operates is that the ultra wealthy make huge investments in what I call the middle management level, the folks who implement their priorities, which includes a large network of think tanks, advocacy organizations, media outlets, and politicians. They invest in the think tanks for research and spokespeople to support their priorities. They invest in media outlets to shape the public narrative in ways that align with their agenda. They invest in a network of advocacy organizations to push that agenda, and they donate to politicians to, of course, get the votes they need. These organizations are the folks who do the dirty work of upholding and expanding systemic racism on a daily basis. For example, they have been instrumental in dramatically expanding the role and size of police departments within communities of color and creating what is now the largest incarcerated population in the world. They're responsible, responsible for the targeting of undocumented immigrants with a barrage of cruel and discriminatory policies. And in education, they've been leading the dismantling of public school systems in favor of school vouchers and charter schools, 
which has inflicted massive harm within black and brown communities. Meanwhile, the folks who get all the popular attention, the self-proclaimed patriots who are pushing back against racial justice, and the police officers and ICE officers who are enforcing the laws, are in reality little more than pawns and lackeys for the super rich. So before we dive any deeper, I think it's important to be clear about what I mean when I say that there is intent behind the strategic racism of the ultra wealthy. That doesn't mean that each of these folks is nefariously twisting his mustache as they come up with their next sinister plan to hurt folks of color. What I mean by intentionality here is just that they know what they're doing. In most and maybe all cases, they knew beforehand what the impact would be from the policies they advocated for. And then after the fact, they know that the criminal legal policies they've advocated for have resulted in more people in jail and prison, and particularly people of color. They know that the immigration policies they've advocated for have led to the exploitation and dehumanization of immigrants. And they know that the education policies they've advocated for have led to major harm to students, families, and communities of color. They know this because the communities most affected by their actions have been saying so loud and clear for decades. And yet they keep going. They keep advocating for the same policies. That's what I mean by being intentional. They know that what they're doing will harm people, and especially people of color, and they do it anyway. Which is, a, I imagine, why they usually try and hide it, or at least disguise it. Of course, it's important to recognize that the injustice being engineered by this group of billionaires and multimillionaires hasn't been limited to people of color. Their portfolio is far more diversified than that. Never was this more apparent to me than when I was investigating how they were contributing to the preservation of racial injustice. Because as I learned more about where they direct their money and the ideology that guides those decisions, I realized how heavily invested the ultra wealthy are in pushing a political agenda that has been deeply harmful to most white Americans as well. In other words, if white people examine the reasons their lives are far more difficult than they need to be, they'll likely eventually run into the same set of organizations and individuals who are leading the opposition against racial equality. You know, I, for one, was astonished to discover in my research just how enormous of an influence the ultra wealthy have on my life and that of everyone I know. So another way to put that is that the struggles of people of color are deeply interconnected with those of white people. So I'll be talking more about that. But first, I'm going to break down how the strategic racism machine works, particularly within the criminal legal system and the education system. So I'll talk about what it looks like, the harm it causes, why it's a priority of the ultra wealthy, how they benefit from it, and some of the strategies they use to pull it off. So let's start with what most people call the criminal justice system, but it's probably more accurately called the criminal legal system. So this part of the book was really for all those people who are made a little uneasy by talk of abolition or the calls to defund police or other parts of the criminal legal system. It wasn't that long ago that I was in the same position. For most of my life, these proposals would have struck me as being too radical. So I've lived much of my life in predominantly white communities and, and in those communities, Police are seen as helpers or even heroes. In most white people's eyes, the word police is synonymous with safety. It's also important to point out that for many white folks, police are practically a non-entity in their lives. For example, in my work, I engage with police officers quite a bit. But outside of that, the last time that a police officer spoke to me about something other than a speeding ticket was over 25 years ago when I was a teenager. And that's simply unfathomable to most of the black and Latinx people that I work with. So through my work, I've seen up close how the criminal legal system operates within predominantly black and brown communities in Chicago and New York and Philadelphia and Oakland and many other cities. And what I found is that most white people have absolutely no idea what that looks like. They don't know what it's like to have an overwhelming police presence around at all times, to have one's community treated as a war zone, to have police and prosecutors opt for really hostile and degrading treatment of the people they're supposed to be serving and protecting. To have many of the members of your community yanked out of that community and put in a cage for doing the same things that happen within predominantly white communities with very different consequences. And unless you've seen how different that is from the average white experience, it can be hard to even believe that, is it, that it exists. So I wanted to share that perspective with others so that they can better understand 
just how vastly oversized, overbroad, and destructive this system is. Because the more exposure I got to the criminal legal system in action within communities of color, the more I was able to see what the residents of those communities see on a daily basis, the more I came to view those so-called radical ideas as obvious and necessary solutions. But maybe the best place to start is by asking this. How did the land of the free, as we call ourselves, wind up with both the largest incarcerated population and the highest incarceration rate in the world? And how did we, with just 5% of the world's population, become home to over 20% of its prisoners? The answer is through the creation of what I call the criminalization trap. So there are some basic choices that must be made in constructing a criminal legal system. First, how are we going to define crime and determine where it's happening? Second, who's going to respond to the crime that we find? And third, what is our response to that crime going to be? Because each one of those questions presents us with a choice of numerous possibilities. And together, those possibilities carry a wide range of potential outcomes that can dramatically alter the direction a society takes. So how have we in the U.S. answered them? With the following. Number one, we've created policies that allow for the highly aggressive enforcement of extremely broad criminal laws, making it remarkably easy to identify crimes and ensuring that virtually every person can be considered a criminal at some point. Number two, we've prioritized the use of law enforcement responses to these crimes over many other possible responses, despite the fact that there's a fundamental mismatch between what law enforcement is trained to do and the skills needed to best address the vast majority of these behaviors. And three, we've emphasized profoundly harmful and punitive consequences for criminal offenses rather than those that would be more effective at holding offenders accountable in meaningful ways, repairing the damage caused by crime, meeting the needs of survivors and victims, addressing the root causes of crime, and breaking the cycle of crime. These are the decisions that have created what is arguably the largest criminal legal system in the history of the world. And I refer to them as the criminalization trap because we didn't have to criminalize people this way. We chose to. In other words, our current system of mass criminalization and incarceration isn't an accidental consequence or unfortunate side effect. The system is doing what it was designed to do. The policies and practices that have been instituted over the past several decades could not have produced anything other than a vastly oversized, overbroad, and destructive criminal legal system, such as the one that we have today. Of course, we also get to decide who's going to be ensnared by that trap. We could have placed it anywhere, but we weren't so indiscriminate. We could have placed it everywhere, but we weren't that inclusive. No, we were both precise and discerning in our approach. We set the criminalization trap where we knew, without a doubt, that it would catch people of color far more than others. How do we do that? Through the following. First, the highly aggressive enforcement of extremely broad criminal laws has been especially focused on black and brown communities. Second, we've invested particularly heavily in the criminal legal system within black and brown communities while underinvesting in systems that would otherwise and could otherwise address the causes of crime and respond to incidents of crime. And third, our desire to punish white criminals often doesn't rise to the same level as our desire to punish people of color. So as a result of 40 plus years of the criminalization trap being the dominant public safety approach in the U.S., our criminal legal system has really become a mass criminalization and incarceration system, as you can see here where we bring far more people into a far more expensive system that employs far more police officers, prosecutors, probation officers, and corrections officers. So that now, if we look back at the criminal legal system that existed in the 1970s, it seems almost incomprehensibly small in comparison. And to illustrate just how much has changed, this is what our spending on the criminal legal system looks like over time. Even after adjusting for inflation, we spend almost five times as much as we did in the, in the early 70s. And to give a sense of just how costly this shift has been, we can calculate how much we spent cumulatively over time beyond what we would have spent if the justice system had stayed the same size. 
In other words, if we had continued to spend $64 billion per year from 1972 to 2016, we would still have one of the largest criminal legal systems in the world. And our total spending on the criminal legal system over that period would have been $2.9 trillion. However, what we actually spent from 1971 to 2016 was $8.2 trillion. Thus, the cost to U.S. taxpayers of expanding our criminal legal system so dramatically has been $5.3 trillion. I call it the $5.3 trillion mistake. Just think about what we could have done with that amount of money. We could have eliminated racial inequities in education and job opportunities, housing and healthcare. We could have eliminated intergenerational poverty. We could have ended our reliance on fossil fuels and addressed climate change before it ever reached crisis levels. We could have done all of these things and more, creating a stronger, healthier, more equitable country. Instead, what we did with those $5.3 trillion is create arguably the largest criminal legal system in the history of the world. As a result of all this spending, just think about all the tasks we now assign to police. In many communities, and especially communities of color, they have to handle the effects of drug and alcohol use, street violence, school disruptions, mental illness, homelessness, street gangs, domestic violence, poor school attendance, organized crime, the drug trade, property offenses, immigration issues, financial crimes, and traffic infractions. In some cities, they're asked to clean up graffiti or capture loose dogs. It's really quite absurd. Over the years, we've added more and more to law enforcement's plate often in a knee-jerk fashion. Whatever the social problem, our default answer to it is almost always to get law enforcement involved. Think about it like this. If we structured our approach to individual health care the same way we structure our approach to addressing public safety and public health issues, we would refer every type of health problem, whether it was chest pains, diabetes, cancer, a torn ACL, or an ingrown toenail, to an orthopedic surgeon. Yet while that strikes us as ridiculous, we seemingly had no problem funneling a staggering variety of public health and safety issues to law enforcement. Plus, we also have to recognize that there is a fundamental mismatch between the law enforcement skill set and what's needed to effectively address the problems police officers are often tasked to address. Because the primary tools in patrol officers' toolbox that distinguish them from other professionals are their ability to incapacitate people through arrests and incarceration and their ability to employ violence, both lethal and non-lethal. And those skills may be necessary in certain situations, but they are not well aligned with what is needed for effective problem solving in more than a small fraction of the situations that police are tasked with addressing. So in short, our over-reliance on law enforcement routinely produces poorly designed responses that are delivered by individuals with the wrong skill sets for the tasks they're asked to perform. We also have to start being honest about the lies we tell each other and ourselves about the criminal legal system. Because what the killings of George Floyd and Dante Wright, Breonna Taylor, and Eric Garner, among so many others, reveal, perhaps more than anything else, is just how much we lie to black and brown communities. Because what US policymakers have been saying to them for the past 40 years is this, we can best keep you safe by being tough on crime by flooding your communities with police officers, by using stop and frisk, by employing what's called broken windows policing and cracking down on low level offenses, by putting police in schools, by locking up people at the highest rates anywhere in the world, by doing the type of policing that has killed so many black and brown folks. And all along the consistent messaging to communities of color has been that these were the most effective strategies for improving public safety. But where's the evidence for that? Where are the heavily policed and high incarceration communities that are flourishing socially, economically, culturally? There are none. It's a null set. Also, if it were true that these were the best strategies, we'd be policing, prosecuting, and incarcerating white communities the same way. If it really were the best set of strategies, wouldn't white communities want the same thing? Wouldn't they be in the offices of their elected officials clamoring for more tough on crime strategies? Because there's more than enough crime within predominantly white communities, white schools, white universities, white workplaces and neighborhoods that currently goes unpoliced and unpunished. And we could be cracking down on those predominantly white spaces the same way we do in communities of color 
and we could fill up our jails and prisons many times over with white teenagers, college students, stockbrokers, Silicon Valley programmers, lawyers, and others who up until now have been largely committing crimes with impunity. We could flip our racial disparities and have a predominantly white prison population in no time. Yet we don't do those things because we don't really believe what we say about how effective those strategies are. Now let's talk about the origins of our profoundly racist mass criminalization system. The typical story that's told about how this criminalization trap was created focuses on politicians, particularly Republican politicians and later Democratic ones, and how they've used tough on crime rhetoric and policy over the past several decades to drive this change. Most of the time that story attributes those policy decisions to legitimate concerns over crime and thus affirms that they were reasonable attempts to address a serious issue. What that story typically omits is how those policies got onto the desks of those politicians in the first place so that they could be voted on and why they were put there. For starters, if you've ever wondered how virtually every state adopted the same sort of harsh criminal sentencing laws, ALEC is your answer. It is the common thread running through many of the laws that drove the growth of our criminal legal system. ALEC created model three strikes laws, mandatory minimum sentencing laws, truth in sentencing laws, and many of the other really terrible policies that they were able to spread like wildfire all across the country. Also very much worth mentioning are private prison companies like Core Civic and Geo Group, which have been hugely impactful in doing the legwork across the country and getting these ideas turned into laws. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the major role that the NRA has played in providing a ground game in support of tough on crime policies. Then there are the various so-called free market pro-corporate think tanks like the Manhattan Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the Reason Foundation, which have played and continue to play a critical role in pushing these tough on crime ideas. While ALEC, the Manhattan Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Reason Foundation, Core Civic, the GEO Group, and NRA have all played a key role in creating and sustaining mass criminalization and incarceration, to truly understand the origins of our current criminal legal system, you have to examine who funds those organizations. And when you start to peel back the onion a bit, you soon find that the true drivers of our current system all come from corporate America and Wall Street. I break this down in detail in the book, including all the major corporations and corporate trade groups that pay dues and make financial contributions to organizations like ALEC, all the so-called philanthropic foundations um, that the ultra-wealthy use to support these organizations, how a small group of investment firms and big banks own the vast majority of the private prison companies, and how gun manufacturers and other dark money donors have funneled tens of millions of dollars into the NRA. Together, this collection of donors represents every major industry and wealth center in the U.S. However, perhaps the individuals most responsible for supporting the organizations driving these extreme criminal legal policies have been Charles Koch and the members of his network, which have donated tens of millions of dollars to the organizations I mentioned and continue to donate to them. Simply put, at the forefront of the effort to create the criminalization trap has been a large and diverse set of major U.S. corporations, big banks, Wall Street firms, investment companies, and foundations created from amassing extreme wealth across numerous industries. These individuals and organizations are collectively responsible for funding and leading many of the organizations that have created and continue to advance mass criminalization and incarceration. Our deeply racist criminal legal system can be attributed in significant part to them. Now, while there are many concerning aspects of these dynamics, perhaps the most insidious is this. The executives and shareholders of these organizations have become extravagantly wealthy off the consumption and labor of the American people, and in return, they've used that wealth to then oppress the very people who made it possible. Why do they support this agenda? In the book, I break this down in great detail, but to summarize, one, they profit off of the privatization and expansion of the criminal legal system. So it's important to know that the mass criminalization and incarceration system is very much big business. You're talking about housing, feeding, providing health care, and transporting over 2 million people, which is more than the population of 15 U.S. states. Plus, you're providing supervision and services for nearly 5 million people on probation and parole, 
which is now known as the treatment industrial complex. So there are multiple billion dollar industries at play here. But the second reason is they profit off of prison labor. So in this country, we have incarcerated people performing a huge variety of extremely low wage or even free labor for large corporations. Third, they use the police to limit democratic action and social movements. Four, they use crime as a wedge issue to split people along racial and socioeconomic lines. Five, the system preserves white supremacy and the racial hierarchy in the U.S. And six, it also helps their preferred political candidates, the folks who support their other political priorities, to win elections. It's also important to understand, though, that while many of the actions I'm describing took place years ago, this is still very much ongoing. For example, after George Floyd was murdered in the summer of 2020, we heard over and over again that it was a wake-up call for the nation and that finally we were going to address the issues that killed George Floyd and so many others. But we didn't. We haven't. If we had, we would have come together as a country around real solutions to systemic racism by now, or at least started to. We would have addressed the vastly oversized and violent mass criminalization system that's being used within black and brown communities as a catch-all solution for an enormous variety of public health and safety issues. These policies and systems are at the very root of what killed George Floyd. These are the dynamics that make black and brown individuals dying at the hands of the police a completely predictable result. But because we couldn't summon the collective urgency to address them, the same things are still happening. Now let's talk about why we haven't addressed them. It's not because we don't know how. It's because there's a very well-funded opposition that sprung into action to prevent change from happening. So it's just one example. That fall, the Heritage Foundation, which again, has, the Koch Network has given at least $8.1 million to, and which has been very active in ALEC over the years, decided to launch a back the blue police pledge to support the status quo in law enforcement in this country. That pledge has now been signed by 212 members of Congress, four governors, 343 state and local officials, and 227,000 members of the public. One of those members of Congress, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, subsequently tweeted out that in the US we have a major under incarceration problem. Now bear in mind again that we have the highest incarceration rate in the world, so it takes some seriously twisted logic to be able to get yourself to that point. And you probably won't be surprised to hear that Senator Cotton has been a major recipient of political contributions from corporate America and Wall Street, and has been a major roadblock to criminal legal reform in the Senate, and now is also a leading contender for the Republican presidential nomination in 2024. I would suggest to you that this is what modern day systemic racism often looks like. We implement public policies that we know will inflict needless harm on large groups of people of color, that we know will perpetuate racial inequities, that we know will even lead to people being killed. And then when that harm becomes apparent, we fail to address it appropriately, in significant part because the ultra wealthy continue to defend these policies and systems vigorously. Now let's move to the education system. At the outset, it's important to recognize that perhaps the defining feature of our education system is that it has never been equitable. At no time in U.S. history have we been willing to put children of color on equal footing with white children. There is simply no golden age of education equity that we can point to, no moment in time in which you could go into schools within communities of color and expect to find the same level of educational opportunities that you would find in schools within predominantly white communities. For literally hundreds of years, people of color have been fighting for the same opportunities to learn that white Americans have enjoyed, and they've been met with massive resistance at every turn. So against that backdrop, I totally understand the frustration and desperation that would lead one to look at other options, to want to try something else, whether it be charter schools or voucher programs. I totally get that, and I don't fault anyone for it. But here's what I would say to anyone who has participated in these efforts or who has a favorable, favorable view of these efforts. I've spent a lot of time over the years working on these issues and addressing the impact of these so-called reforms. And what I would respectfully ask you to consider is how the reforms proposed by school privatization advocates, even if implemented to perfection, are nowhere close to being responsive to the challenges presented by deep-seated education inequities. Additionally, I would request that you consider how alongside whatever benefits you might have witnessed from 
charter schools and school vouchers. This set of reforms has also brought widespread devastation to students, families, and communities of color across the country. Indeed, those who have been harmed the most are the young people who were supposed to be the primary beneficiaries of school choice. And finally, I would ask that you be open to the idea that your benevolent intentions in supporting charter school and voucher expansion may not align with the aspirations of those who are most responsible for pushing this agenda forward. Because school privatization is unquestionably a billionaire-led effort. And for many of these individuals, the primary motivation isn't to raise overall education quality or remedy education inequities. Instead, charter schools and voucher programs are being used as a Trojan horse. They've been weaponized in order to advance a massive money grab that threatens the educational opportunities of almost every child in America. And rather than being a solution to systemic racism, as is often claimed, school privatization has instead been a quintessential example of strategic racism in action. So let's start with the harm being caused. If we take a holistic view, what can be observed is a catastrophic impact on many low-income communities of color due to the expansion of charter schools and vouchers. So a useful place to start is with the impact school privatization has had on public school systems. All across the country, public schools are being closed in huge numbers and essentially replaced with charter schools and voucher programs. Sometimes public schools are simply converted to charters. Other times, charter schools and voucher programs are brought in and put in direct competition with public schools. Regardless, it has produced a national epidemic of mass public school closures. For example, in Chicago, there have been at least 126 school closures since 2009. In Detroit, more than 200 public schools have been closed since the year 2000. In St. Louis, at least 44 schools have been closed in the last 20 years, plus many, many others in black and brown communities across the US. While these public school systems are being decimated, the charter systems within these and many other communities of color, color are expanding rapidly. So for example, New Orleans is now 100% charter schools post Hurricane Katrina. The school systems in Washington DC, Detroit and Kansas City now have over 40% of their students in charter schools. Both Los, Los Angeles and New York City now have more than 100,000 students in charters while Miami, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Houston all have at least 50,000. And as be can be seen here, the charter sector is rapidly swallowing up school systems in cities nationwide. In fact, as of 2017, 2018, there were 214 districts with at least 10% of their students in charter schools, compared to just 64 in 2007 and 2008. And as for vouchers, there are currently at least 25 such programs operating in 14 states and DC and voucher-like programs that redirect public money to private schools, such as what are often called education savings accounts, scholarship tax credits, and tuition tax credits, are also proliferating. It's important to remember that school privatization efforts were initially billed as seeking to provide a few quote-unquote laboratories of innovation that would better meet the needs of a small number of students of color forced to attend what are often described as chronically failing schools. However, the goal of that sector is now quite clearly to simply take over large chunks, if not the entirety of public school systems. That was made apparent in post-Katrina New Orleans and, and elsewhere. For example, in 2015, the superintendent of Palm Beach County Public Schools in Florida, home to over 182,000 students, sought permission from state lawmakers to turn the entire school district over to charter schools. Additionally, in 2015, the Los Angeles Times uncovered a secret plan being developed that sought to place half of all students within LA Unified School District into charter schools over the following eight years. And just last spring, Florida passed a $200 million expansion to their voucher program. While these developments are generally celebrated in school privatization circles, what's rarely talked about are the harms associated with them because it is a deeply traumatic thing to close down schools to students, their families, and entire communities. All at once, some of the most important relationships in their lives with friends, teachers, and mentors can be severed. And for many young people, the loss of their school also represents the loss of a reliably safe and stable place in their lives. For some, it means losing the only such place they have. More broadly, People lose their jobs, community bonds are severed, families are strained, people and businesses often leave the community, property values are often reduced, 
community violence often increases and the community be can become a less desirable place to live. So overall, there are very few things that are more devastating to communities than closing their schools. Additionally, when schools are closed, the remaining public schools often have to assume a substantial additional burden. They have to absorb many of the students who were displaced by the closures, creating overcrowded schools and larger class sizes. They typically become even more under-resourced as funds are siphoned off to charter schools and voucher programs. There are many more types of harm caused by school privatization, which I describe in the book. But overall, what we've seen is that school privatization frequently triggers a downward spiral from which many communities never recover. There's now a familiar pattern to how these dynamics take place. First, the public schools are systematically under-resourced and overly maligned as failing, which drives many families away. Desperate for better options, many of those families go to the shiny new charter schools or voucher programs that are being touted by policymakers and are receiving glowing media coverage. The remaining public schools are then further strained as a result of the dynamics I just described, which often leads to their closure. However, that only deepens the spiral as the remaining public schools are increasingly overburdened, more families and educators are driven away, there's additional harm caused to the surrounding community, and thus more closures. As a result, one of the most likely outcomes from school closures is that additional closures will soon follow, with the collateral damage expanding exponentially. On the other side of the equation, if you strip away all the noise surrounding these issues, the premise advanced by school privatization advocates is this. If you shift from public to private management and eliminate some regulations that the schools have to follow, then education quality will improve dramatically and the impact of generations of multifaceted racial inequities will be eliminated or at least substantially reduced. The entire idea is ludicrous on its face. There is no way that any thoughtful observer could examine the challenges faced by the students, families, and educators within low-income communities of color and conclude that privatization would magically solve them. It simply doesn't compute. And that is really the dirty little secret of school privatization advocates, that their so-called movement is based on hype, not substance. So when you add all that up, no matter how much weight is given to any innovations or competition-related advances that may have occurred as a result of school privatization, no one could reasonably suggest that the changes were worth the enormous harm that has been caused. That in itself should be more than sufficient to invalidate and put an end to this series of so-called reforms, particularly as the harm threatens to become increasingly severe as charter schools and voucher programs proliferate further. Nevertheless, School privatization efforts continue to expand, and by far the biggest reason for that is the money behind it. Let's be clear. School privatization efforts may have garnered support from various stakeholders over the years, but it is unmistakably a hostile takeover of public schools that is being led by a small group of billionaires. If not for the staggering financial investment of this small group of individuals, there is simply no way that charter schools and school vouchers would have caused such extensive harm to black and brown communities across the country. For example, in the book, I looked at just 10 billionaires or families who prioritized school privatization. I looked at Bill Gates, the Walton family, Charles Koch, Mark Zuckerberg, and a handful of others, and I tracked how much they spent on 50 organizations that had been active in promoting charter schools and school vouchers. Now, there are many more billionaires who fall in the same camp and many more organizations that have been created to advance this agenda. But just looking at those 10 sources, giving to just those 50 organizations, what I found was staggering. So, for example, this small group of billionaires has given tens of millions of dollars to numerous advocacy groups that have been leading this effort. They've also given tens of millions of dollars to prominent think tanks who've been doing much of the research supporting this effort. They've given hundreds of millions of dollars to two charter school investment funds, which are essentially venture capitalists for charter schools. They've even given tens of millions of dollars to education media outlets, which, not surprisingly, have featured a lot of favorable pieces on this issue. So if you add all this stuff up, just to these 50 organizations from these 10 sources, 
I tracked $3.2 billion in investments into these organizations. And again, this is just a small piece of the overall effort, but I do think it can provide a sense of how these individuals use their wealth in ways that create an exponentially greater role for themselves in shaping education policies than the parents, students, and community members who are most affected by those policies. As for why they do it and how they profit off of it, the book goes into a lot of detail about that, and I don't want to suggest that this sector is monolithic, because it's not. But the shorthand is that many of these folks fight for school privatization for the same reasons that they fight to privatize Social Security and the post office, why they despise Medicare and Medicaid and single-payer health care, and why they love private prisons and immigrant detention centers. Number one, because they can make money off of it. Number two, because they can reduce costs and thus their own tax liability. And number three, because it gives them greater control to shape policy around their interests. This is very much a part of what I call the doctrine of corporate greed. Within the swirling winds of politics, the primary corporate America and Wall Street agenda has been the one constant in recent decades. While it's been presented to the public in a number of different ways over the years, the actual content of it has been remarkably consistent and predictable. It has invariably focused very, very narrowly on the economic interests of large corporations and Wall Street. And while its proponents often portray their efforts as part of some deeply principled ideology, ultimately what is advocated for by its proponents, including many, but certainly not all, top executives from the, company's largest, from the country's largest corporations, banks, and investment firms, is a series of policies whose common denominator is that they all allow corporate America and Wall Street executives to expand their wealth often at the expense of everyone else. This agenda has dominated Republican politics for decades, and elements of it now hold sway over segments of the Democratic Party as well. And it prioritizes the following types of policy positions. One, lowering taxes on the wealthy and on corporations. Two, fighting wage increases. Three, cutting public services that benefit low-income working class and middle-class families. Four, promoting the creation of new profit-making opportunities, such as through privatizing public services and tapping into quote-unquote new markets in the U.S. or abroad. Five, reducing business regulations, particularly those that impede wealth accumulation. Six, opposing labor unions, thus facilitating wage cuts and reductions in worker protections. And lastly, seven, convincing the public to subsidize corporations, either directly, such as through tax breaks and bailouts, or indirectly, such as through publicly funded services that favor corporate interests. And as a result of massive financial investments in their efforts, they have successfully made the profitability of large corporations arguably the single most dominant consideration in contemporary American politics. Now this cuts across every major area of policy, but notice how school privatization supports all of these goals. For example, there are so many money-making opportunities from privatizing the $650 billion public education system that all of the major Wall Street investment banks have set up special funds devoted to profiting off it. It's also been an extremely effective union-busting strategy and has essentially replaced experienced unionized teachers with largely inexperienced non-unionized teachers while also allowing schools to avoid regulations protecting students with disabilities and, and English learners. Thus, it's a very effective cost-cutting strategy. And it's also given corporate America far more control over school operations, which is, in a nutshell, why our increasingly heavily tested kids are increasingly treated like widgets and why we now have STEM-focused preschools. So it's very important to understand that these efforts to promote charter schools and school vouchers, which are often portrayed as acts of benevolent philanthropy or as racial justice efforts, are firmly aligned with the economic interests of the ultra-wealthy. And these individuals have given every indication that their sights are set on all public schools, not just those within communities of color. So that is a summary of what strategic racism looks like in two issue areas, though we could certainly talk about many others, and I do in the book, particularly with regard to immigration. But beyond that, the book is really intended to give people a roadmap for what it will take to truly address these problems. Because while it's very doable, there's still not enough people supporting racial justice efforts and far too many people opposing them. The good news though, is that the solutions to these problems are actually fairly straightforward. 
In the book, I discuss them in great detail. They've all been identified by grassroots leaders from the communities most directly impacted by these issues, and they are all eminently attainable. They include, one, right-sizing and defunding all aspects of the criminal legal system and reinvesting those resources into multidisciplinary prevention, intervention, and systems of care. And two, ending school privatization and addressing the education debt owed to communities of color across the country by truly designing schools around the developmental needs of students. Beyond that though, what I hope people will do is join in this effort of reimagining what we could be as a country. In the book, I talk about creating liberatory communities, which are communities designed around the needs of the people who live there by the people who live there. Because if you eliminate just these couple examples of systemic racism and strategic racism that I talk about in the book, and implement some pretty modest wealth taxes and other taxes on Wall Street and corporate America, you can pretty quickly free up a trillion dollars a year. And there's a whole lot you can do with a trillion dollars a year. I give some examples in the book of how you can increase education spending by 50%. You can put the U.S. on the path to environmental sustainability. You can make public colleges and universities tuition free. You can hire one million new community health and safety workers like mental and behavioral health experts and social workers to create a humane alternative to the mass criminalization and incarceration system. And you can create a universal pre-K program. You can do all of that with a trillion dollars. But there are a lot of different options for what we could be doing. The key point is that we need to ensure that public investments match our values and our needs, because right now they clearly are not. The challenge, however, is that the companies who support and benefit from strategic racism are not a select group. On the contrary, they represent hundreds of the largest and most well-known corporations in the U.S., which together employ a sizable percentage of our population and provide many of the products and services that most U.S. residents use on a daily basis. So there can be no denying that their enormous accumulated wealth has turned them into a formidable political force. And the reality is that there's really only one effective counterweight to the power of such organized wealth, and that's the power of organized people. So to resist the corporate American Wall Street agenda and ultimately advance an agenda that's more favorable to low-income, working-class, and middle-class families, we need to build people-powered organizations that can advance multiracial mass movements. Building those types of strong mass organizations represents really the difference between winning and losing between having a powerful organized force pushing for change and merely having a large number of isolated voices in the wilderness. Because there can be a million protesters out in the streets yelling about various injustices, but if those million protesters are a million atomized individuals, then whatever impact is created by their actions will quickly dissipate. However, if those million protesters are members of organizations that can build off the momentum created by that protest and channel it into positive social change, then we start to collectively shift the needle. So there are two key action items I recommend in the book. The first is simply to show up for racial justice based building organizations. It's critically important that low income working class and middle class people who support racial justice have a consistent organized presence to advance that agenda. Fortunately, there are already numerous grassroots racial justice organizations all across the US within every single state. Unfortunately, these organizations are typically severely under-resourced relative to their opposition. Thus, to truly build the type of unified grassroots force that can defeat the ultra-wealthy agenda, we're going to have to make a collective investment in these types of organizations. Certainly, that includes financial investments, as all these organizations would greatly benefit from donations, even small ones. But beyond that, these organizations need people who can invest their time, their skills, and their perspective to advancing racial justice efforts. They need people who can, who can conduct research, who can analyze data, who can assist with public relations and communications and provide policy and legal assistance. They need visual artists, musicians, and dancers. They need cooks, fundraisers, and people who are just good at getting things done. They need people who can share their lived experiences with the systems of oppression that they are confronting on a daily basis. So whatever skills or knowledge you've accumulated in your life, it is virtually guaranteed that at least some of it would be of great value to an existing or potential mass movement. And even if you don't want to contribute in any of those ways, 
these grassroots organizations also just need people who will consistently show up for public events. So if you're inclined to want to advance racial justice, start by finding an organization near you and seeing what you can do to help to move its agenda forward. And if you need a place to start, in the book and on my website, I have lists of some of the best and most strategic racial justice organizations in the country. These are organizations like Communities United in Chicago, Black Organizing Project in Oakland, Movimiento Poder in Denver, Dream Defenders in Florida, Puente in Phoenix, and the many organizations like them that are leading the way on racial justice issues. So there may be nothing more valuable that individuals could do to advance racial justice They'd contribute whatever time, energy, and money they have available to support the work of these or other like-minded organizations. And action item number two is to create community equity assemblies. So beyond plugging into the racial justice infrastructure that has already been built, we also need to create new structures for more people to become involved, particularly for the members of communities that have been systematically excluded from the political process for generations. In every community in the U.S. that struggles with equity issues, which is to say every community in the U.S., we need to create community equity assemblies where regular people can come together to learn about systemic racism and other forms of oppression and then get to work in dismantling them. These don't need to be formal bodies, particularly initially, just places where community members can gather together and find ways to collaborate. They also don't have to be large. You know, as is demonstrated every day all across the country, even small groups of dedicated advocates can have a remarkable impact within a community. However, over time, if we can grow these assemblies by bringing in more like-minded people from our neighborhoods, workplaces, community groups, places of worship, student groups, labor unions, volunteer organizations, and other formations, then the possibilities for what we can accomplish together begin to grow dramatically. All of a sudden, the many people of all races and ethnicities who care about these issues can become transformed from a collection of individuals into a powerful political force. From there, they can start influencing policy decisions. They can demand at the, a seat at the table for budgetary decisions. They can hold policymakers accountable in far more meaningful ways. And in relatively short order, they can create truly transformative change in their communities. So finally, I just want to thank you all for your interest in these issues. I truly believe that in the coming years, we have a chance to institute the most significant social change in U.S. history. Of all the things we could accomplish as a country, of all the milestones we could achieve, of all the injustices we could remedy, none would be more significant than dismantling the centuries-old systemic racism that continues to devastate and marginalize tens of millions of people of color across the U.S., it is the foremost challenge of our lifetimes to not merely be content in saying black lives matter, but to collectively step up and truly actualize those words. I sincerely hope that you will find a way to contribute whatever you can to this movement and that what I included in the book and this talk can be helpful to you along the way.